Bond projected <coughs> since it opened. Like I went to the, the only time I ever saw this movie projected was at the premiere, and that was in ninety. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, here, hold on. Yes, this is whoops. Wait, 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 oh, okay. <coughs> oh, okay so Howard just uh, <coughs> texted yeah. Tom Savini and said what we're doing tonight, and Tom said, "Talk about the dick now." Yes. Go right here. So, so I'm going to talk. I'm going to. We're going to walk through. Yeah, we're going to walk through. I, I gathered a bunch of behind-the-scenes photos that we that I took on set of Dust Till Dawn, and this was like back in the good old days where it was just like total ball to the wall, man. It's like we worked so hard. Greg Nicotero and myself were on set. For this, for we uh, the whole uh, titty twister sequence we shot was on stage. It sort of was a stage. It was basically just an old building they converted into a set. And this that whole all that vampire stuff took six weeks to shoot. It was in the dead of summer in Los Angeles. It was so hot and sweaty and gross. They it, it got so hot in there, matter of fact, that they had like these um, temperature readers uh, in the ceilings. And if it got too hot, they would burst, and then all the sprinklers would come on and. We would take those; they would be bubbling at the end of it, like at the end of the day, and almost had, they had to shut us down to let the set cool down. And during lunch, they had these big, giant air conditioning vents, and we would just crawl inside the vents and lay in the vents during lunch just to cool off. It was so hot and miserable. You know what, Howard? Why don't you start at the very okay, beginning? Yeah. Because you know, I think uh, a lot of people don't yeah, you're right. know that this was the first screenplay ever written by his, I can't, can't remember his I don't know who I can, somebody It's obscure Q, writer, Q. 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 So yeah, so let, let me, I'll give a little bit of background about Dust Till Dawn. Okay, so K and B uh, originally was uh, Bob Kurtzman, K, uh, Greg Nicotero, N, and Howard Berger, B. So Bob, the K, had written a 25 page outline for a movie he, he wanted to make called From Dust Till Dawn. And it was a, a gangster movie that turns into a vampire movie, it was very non-linear. Um, Sorry if any of you have not seen it yet. Uh, yeah. Just ignore what you That's just right. said. Yeah, no, it's not a spoiler. I'm sure you, you saw it, and you know you see what's up here. So, um, <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. Anyhow, we knew Quentin before he was famous, and we had met Quentin at uh, we'd have summer barbecues at a friend's house, Scott Spiegel, who co-wrote Evil Dead Two. So we would go over to Scotty's house every Sunday. You know, we were all young, and we met this geeky guy who worked at the video store named Quentin. And he was a writer, and uh, or trying to be a writer, and we read a couple of his scripts. You know that uh, uh, there was one was called True Romance, one was Natural Born Killers, one was Pulp Fiction, I think. And we're like, yeah, he's pretty good. And, uh, anyhow, Bob was like, I gotta get a real writer, so he hired Quentin to write his the script, and it was the very first script Quentin was ever paid for, paid to write. He got paid. We paid him off fifteen hundred dollars U.S. And the promise that if he ever directed his own movie, we would do the effects for free. In fact, me and we're like, he works at a video store. He's never going to direct. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, yeah, yeah, we'll do it for free. We'll do it for free. Right, right, right. So he wrote, he wrote the script. Bob sent it out all over Hollywood. Uh, it got returned with like the worst studio notes. Like, this is the worst script ever. You can't do two movies in one. It's not linear. You can't have a. Is it a gangster film or is it a monster movie? What's going on? Da da da. da. All right. So the script dies, goes away. Meanwhile, Bob has been thinking about it forever because he always has tunnel vision and he storyboards the whole movie. And uh, he wanted to direct it. He was gonna do a low budget version of it. Anyhow, it never happened. Then Quentin calls one day, he's like, hey guys, I'm calling in the other favor. I got some money, I'm gonna make this movie. And we're like, oh wow, I never thought that would happen. It's like, okay, you know, let us read the script. We read the script, it's fantastic. But still, it's like, okay, well, we'll see what the, 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 you know, the guy at the front desk at the, you know, for the video plays will do. Anyhow, we go to set, we do all the stuff, we do all the blood, we cut a guy's ear off, we do this, we do that. <laughs> then Quentin finishes the movie and he calls us one night. He's like, hey, I'm gonna screen the movie in Hollywood. Come out and see it. We go and see it. It's unbelievable. We walk out, our jaws are on the floor, and it was Reservoir Dogs. So the next day, everybody in Hollywood thinks everything Quentin wrote is genius, including Dust <laughs> Long. So everyone's like calling Bob and like wants to buy the script. Like it's one of the best scripts we've ever read. All the uh, these are all the same people. This shows you how old. <laughs> all the same people who said this is the worst script we've ever read. Anyhow, it goes on and on. Quentin then makes you know wins an Oscar. He does this. He did it. He's getting huger and huger. But all through that, he stays super loyal to us. He always calls us for every show. I've worked on every single Quentin movie, with the exception of Jackie Brown, because there was nothing in Jackie Brown for us. That's the only reason we didn't work on it. Um, 
and we've been very loyal to him. Whenever he needs us, we're there 100. percent You know, you know. I even went to, to China for six months to work on Kill Bill, and when I was only supposed to go for three three weeks, so that was my ex-wife was very happy to hear I was not coming home for six months. <laughs> Hence the ex-wife. Um, but uh, but anything for Quentin. So <laughs> the the script end, ends up getting purchased. And they end up, uh, Ro or, uh, Quentin ends up attaching Robert Rodriguez, who had just done two movies, El Mariachi, which was this little low budget film, and then um, Desperado, which it was just coming out, which I think is a really cool movie. And meanwhile, we had storyboarded the whole movie, and we just gave Robert all, all the storyboards, and we're like, here's your movie, you know, knock it out, man. And it was just really super fun. So, one of the, one of the, um, Characters in the movie is, is a character named Sex Machine that's played by Tom Savini. This is Tom Savini here. This is Tom, obviously, as a vampire. Uh, and that's Tom with a penis nose, which he was very excited about. Uh, but Tom is, is like, a, if you don't know who Tom Savini is, he's one of the, the, the major uh, like masters of gore makeup effects guys. Like Tom created like makeup gore effects. Uh, he's responsible for Friday the 13th, the very first one. Also, Dawn of the Dead, um, Day of the Dead, Creep Show. Tom's iconic, but Tom also is an actor. So, anyhow, this is a makeup I applied. It was sculpted by a really genius artist named Norman Cabrera. This is us in the shot getting some of our vampires ready. So, the, where we shot Dust Till Dawn was actually the, there's a company called Laurie's Meat Seasoners, and there's those like for season. They make seasoning for meat, but it had it had moved. And we converted it into a into a studio area, and this was where our shop was, where we were doing makeup and getting everything ready. Was where they stored all the meat. It was like a, it was like a cold storage. So that's Melanie Tooker, who uh, is there painting up one of the vampires. And you see all the vampires in the background. That's myself. Uh, back when you were allowed, to, when you were supposed to have mullets. <laughs> and that's Greg Nicotero, who's been my my best friend and business partner for. 40 years, um, and that is what we call the mouth bitch. That's what the name of this character is. And one of our guys named Henrik von Reisen played this character. He was one of the shop guys. And a lot of times we grab our guys from the shop and we're like, okay, you're gonna be this monster, you're gonna be that monster. Because monster guys make the best monsters. So, but this was a full suit. <laughs> it was really a fun monster. It's a full suit with a head. You can kind of see where we glued it down right there. Um, but yeah, Henrik, and Henrik was blind in this matter of fact. And there's one shot in the movie. Okay, so when all the monsters are walking towards, um, I think George and the bunch of them, you'll see this, uh, he steps on somebody and you see a dead body like twitch and come up like that because he stepped on their head or something like that. <laughs> but I would always look at it, it's like on the bottom of the frame and you see him stepping forward and then somebody just kind of like, oh! Unfortunately, just, everyone's on dead. Yeah, they're on dead anyhow, so. Uh, yep, yep, yep. But this is this is the standard look of a makeup effects guy in 1996. <laughs> and 2006. And yeah. 2006. No, no, we all cleaned up. I cleaned. I cut my hair shortly after this. Uh, and there's there's uh, there's the mouth bitch on set, and, and that's Gino Carabnali, who's another makeup effects guy who was on our crew. And Gino's from uh, Pittsburgh. Really great guy. Super talented artist. And uh, all of us got to be in the movie too. That's the fun thing. So Gino got to be this character. Greg's in the movie, and I'm in the movie. Another sequence to keep your eye out for. So when Savini, Tom Savini, sex machine gets bit, I do the biting. I'm the vampire that turns Tom Savini. So, and then he kills me. And Tom really complained, didn't he, about wearing makeup? Like the makeup guy, he said he liked wearing it for like ten minutes. We could run around the set and scare people. Yeah. And screw around and goof off, but then it was just horrible. Yeah, it's, like, it's one of his nightmares. He always says, I have nightmares about like glue and like, you know, crooks of his knees and all that. So I made sure when I did the makeup, I, I to torture him, I got my glue and I put his arms out and I put glue in the nooks of his arms first and under the knees just to bother him. And he's like, why are you doing that? I'm like, I don't know. I just, I know it can be made <laughs> uh, This is a, a little closer photo of one of the crazy vampires. We had so many vampires. And as you'll see when you watch the movie, there's like dancers that are vampires, and then they get the vampires, you know, we one up and one up and one up. And it starts off as like, um, you know, these very sexy, like stripper uh, girls that turn into vampires. So they were pretty much just paint makeups and all that. And I remember on the first day, there was like four or five of us in the makeup room, and we're making up all these beautiful women. I'm like, oh my God, this is the best job ever. But after a while, 
you don't even, you're so sick of it all. So like after a week and a half, I'm like, oh, just whatever, just get undressed, let me just paint you, you know? Like, okay, go, done, done, go, go, go. Well, you missed the spot, it's fine, no, we're never gonna see it. So. That's a, this is another makeup effects guy, Wayne Pa, who's one of my key guys on the show. So Wayne got to play one of these vampires as well. And, it's, and everything was foam rubber, so it's, it's really traditional and old school, with all these crazy hair pieces and dentures, and everybody had contact lenses. And, and this was early on when we were using lenses. They used to be hard, and now they're soft lenses. We had soft lenses on this, but they were really thick. And I had, when I had to put lenses in, Literally, Savini, Greg, and like three other people sat on me. I was on the ground, and they're like shoving these lenses in my eyes. It was horrifying. I just, I don't like. It was one of the few times I'm like, okay, I'll put lenses in. But once they were in, I never took them out. I'm like, I'm not taking them in now. This is uh, another one of our vampires. This is like towards the end uh, of the film. You'll see there's like they get bigger and bigger and more monstrous. This is another one of our guys, Jake McKinnon, wearing this suit. It's a full suit with a big mechanical head. Crazy bat guy. There's uh, there's Norman Cabrera who sculpted the makeup of Flying Tom's makeup. That's Norman there. He's really quite amazing. If you guys have watched the um, the Guillermo del Toro show that's on Netflix, Norman sculpted a lot of that. He also sculpted and designed the Angel of Death from Hellboy 2. Uh, he's unbelievable. So, but yeah, here's Tom getting made up. You can see how excited he is. This is before his contact lenses are in. And there's uh, this is a very standard photo of Robert. Always has a guitar in his hand. Robert, Rob Rodriguez uh, talking to uh, Fred uh, Williamson, Fred the Handle Williamson. But Robert, Robert just walks around with a guitar and stuff. What is the deal with that? I, it's just, he just, I think it's because he has a slight attention deficit, <laughs> seriously. And I think it, it just keeps him focused. And he's just always playing his guitar and strumming. And it just keeps him on track. You know? And it's just part of the thing, you know, that and, and the bandana. So. <coughs> but, but it was fun working with Fred, because you know, Fred's a big, giant foot guy from football, uh, American football. So he was in this giant makeup. And these, these guys never complain, like I was thinking. There's only one person, I'll, let's see if we get to it, I can't remember. But there really only one actor, and I'm like, we better get a double for this person, because they're never going to get into it. <coughs> uh, here we are on set again with Robert and the mouth fish. And the reason why we call it the mouth fish, I don't know if I brought any photos, but this stomach opens up and it's a gigantic mouth, you know. There's one of our other hero guys, who's Ernie, who, who's one of our bar or our bouncer vampire. And again, I think Norman sculpted this. Everything Norman sculpted a lot of the stuff on the show. It all has his style. And that's Danny Trejo, um, and I did this makeup. And I, the, if the sh photo was wider, you know, Danny has this big tattoo down here on his chest. So I had a, the piece went over that, and I had a hand draw that tattoo every day and try to match it. So and I think I did a pretty good job. Um, but yeah, this is Danny in full lenses and full prosthetics and dentures. And I mean, Danny was scary without all this stuff. You know? <laughs> I was always like, oh. but he's such a nice guy. He's a really super nice guy. Not at all the way he comes across in movies or, or the way, you know, first impressions looking at him and going, oh, scary dude. Now, he was a scary dude at one point. He's now all good. <clears throat> There's Norman doing another uh, vampire makeup, touching up around the lips and stuff. No lenses are in yet. We've got some wonderful stories from yeah. Norman in so, the book. Yeah, we do. Norman, Norman talks a lot of, about some cool stuff. So this is the one day Selma Hayek would let us put this makeup on. Uh, so in the movie, Selma Hayek plays this character, Tintanica, and it was a big, giant snake, uh, snake makeup. So I met Selma, she came in for life casting, and that's the first thing we do when we have an actor, is like do, do a, take an impression of their head and whatever else we need. And she did okay in that, but I then could, I could kind of smell that she was gonna not want to do this really, so um, we you know, started to show her how it was all to go, went together, and she's like, oh, I don't know about this, I don't know about this. And um, I went to Robert and I said, listen, we should get a double, because I have a feeling today's gonna be the only day with Selma, and then it's gonna be the double, the rest of them, all the other scenes. He's like, oh no, she'll do it, man, she'll do it. And I'm like, so I knew somebody, uh, this girl Nadine, who was a dancer who I used in Evil, or on Army of Darkness, who played the Winged Deadite, if you saw Army of Darkness, that big, that's Nadine in that suit. And I'm like, I'm gonna have Nadine just come to set tomorrow. And so anyhow, we, we shot this, it's a, this was like one quick shot looking up at her, 
as she transforms. And then after that, she's like, I'm never going in that again. And I'm like, thank goodness I brought Nadine in, so we're good, we're good. So uh, there's Tom Savini, and here's some of our guys. Too. That, that's Wayne, uh, again, he gets to be another vampire. This guy's Brian Ray, who worked at the shop. This is one of the fun things about working in a monster shop, that you get to be a monster in movies, like I said. And then that's Norman there. So these guys all had a real fun time getting to play up against their, their idol, Savini, because we all love Tom Savini. Okay, so there, that, I have a lot, for some reason I put a lot of the mouth stitch in, I don't know why. <laughs> Anyhow, that's where her, you can kind of see her stomach's open, she's got big teeth, and she ends up, that guy Gino, she ends up biting Gino's head off. So we have like a mechanical insert section that kind of chomp, 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 it was like a pair of scissors, we made it like that. And so we just, and we had a puppet of Gino, and he just bit the head off and then spit the head out, and we kind of like a, 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 bowling, a bowling ball version of Gino's head, which is kind of like always. There's Robert, and, there, and this is Quentin Tarantino in his makeup. And this was a really hard makeup to come up with. We had like two or three sculptors work on this until we hit it right, and Wayne, top, ended up hitting it just right, because Quentin has a monstrous head to start with. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we kept like looking at it, and I'm like, no, it's not right yet, it's not right. And Robert said, just make it look like Quentin. <laughs> like just, you know, and we're like, okay, giant forehead, giant chin, you know, you know, because th that's Quentin's nose, there's nothing on his nose. And I think it was like cheek pieces there, and then the separate chin, and then a whole forehead. And then uh, I'm trying to think if that was a hair piece. That might have just been Quentin's hair too, I broke the film over. But, and then contact lenses and dentures. But yeah, that was the whole thing. It's like, we got to, it just wasn't happening. Like, so, so we went to one sculptor, two sculptors, and then Wayne took it and he knocked it out. And I'm like, that's it, that's it. And then we had to do a skull, because once, you know. Has everybody seen the movie, by the way? Yeah, pretty much. You haven't seen the movie? Or you did? You have, okay. And you have it, okay, I won't, I won't say. So if something happens, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, you'll never know, I'm not giving anything away. But anyhow, we had to do a skull of Quentin, like a, you know? And that was, it's a really funny sculpture, because it's got a big giant chin and this giant forehead. So I think we ended up giving that to Quentin at the end of the show, anyhow. Why so uh, much hate for Quentin? No, I love Quentin. He's the greatest. He's my favorite director, actually. Um, working with Quentin is like one of the most fulfilling and rewarding uh, jobs uh, I have ever had. And every time we get to work with him, he's so, um, he lets us do what we know is gonna be best for the film, which is great, you know, and, and you don't always get that. And he's so great about explaining his vision. And what's nice is nowadays on movies, there's a, well, that, what's not nice on movies is there's hundreds of people that have a say, but on films we work with Quentin on, it's singular, you know, so only, only um, it's only his voice. And what he says is what, happens and it's the greatest thing ever I, he, i've only had great experiences with quentin and it's just like you know when you have somebody whose head is a very specific shape and size we were just trying like we got to come up with something so cool that still like looks like quentin so it, it, that was the hardest makeup we did on the show actually but um no he's been he's been wonderful all these decades and, he's not a god. what's that he's not, a god. he's not a god i don't know i i thoroughly love working with him Hopefully he does one more movie. So, um, and this is uh, this is another. This is one of the paint vampires that we had. So there's Tom killing her. And so yeah, this, this is how we start off in the movie. We had all these girls, and they were all stunt girls actually, because they had to do all the stunts, get stabbed and shot up, and all that crazy stuff. So uh, so these were all paint makeups. We put these 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 ladies through every single day, and dentures and contacts. And there's Tom getting ready for the day, and there's uh, let's see. That's Gino, right there. That's Rob Henderson who did all the dentures for us. Tom's got one contact lens in right there. Here we are getting getting steak vampires ready. So that's that's Gino, that's Greg. And then yeah, we had all these rigs. So we could have all these vampires laying dead on the ground with all the steaks sticking out. And so they were like on these rigs that had appliances over the over the whole, you know, over the rig so it looked like it was their skin. There's a bunch of vampires again. That's Wayne, that's Jake, who plays the big bad creature as well. This guy here, this is Michael McKay. Did you guys see the movie Seven? Mm -hmm. He played Sloth, or not Sloth, uh, not Sloth. It was, which is the, what's the guy who's stuck, in, who's in bed dying with all the, all the wounds and so forth. That might, no, Sloth was the heavy set guy. 
But anyhow, that was Michael McKay, who's super, super thin, and he's like this teeny little guy. He looks just like the guy in the movie. So, but it, he was great. He came, he came in and was a great vampire. And there's Wayne again as a scary vampire. And then here we are sculpting. This is the, some of the guys sculpting some of the vampires in the shop. And there's home again. And there's the end of the fly spell. Very exciting. Cool. Does anybody have any questions about anything that you saw up there or about the making of Dust Till Dawn or the yeah. book? Yeah? Sorry, um, yeah. How many characters did you guys do? And what was the turnaround time? It was, well, back then, in the good old days, we had a lot of time, you know? Normally you would have, you know, maybe six or five or six months, five or six months of, uh, of uh, pre-production. So we, we did a design process, figured out what Clinton wanted, figured out what was in the script. And you know, that whole sequence, that whole fight sequence with all the vampires, in the script it says, all hell breaks loose. And that's all it said. So that's when, <laughs> so that's when we had, a, we storyboarded everything, and you know, that's where we came up with the giant rat, you know, that, that's in there, and a whole bunch of other crazy stuff. None of that's in the script. But we just would brainstorm, and like, oh, we should have this guy, and then one of the guys turns into a giant rat, and then there's this, and there's that, and there's this. So it just kept going on and on and on. And this was actually like one of the first films George Clooney was in. So he, he hadn't even won an Emmy yet for, it was the first season of ER. And um, you know, we had Harvey Keitel and Juliette Lewis and, and um, you know, Harvey was, I think I was telling Mark a little bit ago, Harvey was really, really serious. Like a very, he's a very serious actor, is a serious actor. But he wouldn't ever let himself have fun on set. It was really interesting. But George is a, likes to goof around and, and have fun. And he just kept trying to break Harvey every single day, every single day. And I think it was like a Friday night. It was like, I don't know, two in the morning. We're still shooting. We were shooting like six, seven days a week. And they're doing something where they're like beating, I think, uh, one of the vampires to death. And George just starts laughing. And then Harvey starts laughing. And then they just start laughing together. And it just becomes a really ridiculous scene. Granted, we were all exhausted. And after that, Harvey was like very light and like having fun. And he's like, George broke me. Now I, I didn't realize you can have fun working on movies, you know? <laughs> and then George would goof on on, uh, uh, on Harvey, and Harvey would goof on George. And, you know, Juliet Lewis was really cool. And there's a, before we started the film, there's one other scene to take a look at where Cheech Marin's in this, and he's a vampire. And he, uh, he gets uh, something, a camera stabbed or something, and his eyes blow out. And the goo shoots all over Juliet Lewis. So we had a puppet head of Cheech with the eye, exploding eyes and all that. And I had it rigged up to a big fire extinguisher filled with all this white goo. And so I kind of demoed it for Robert and Juliet uh, Julia Lewis saw it. She's like, don't get, don't hit me in the face with that stuff, please. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so, you know, I'm puppeteering and I'm getting ready. And Robert just leans over and goes, and he's like, douse her. Douse her in the face. <laughs> and, go, and then boom, get her in the face. So what's in the what's in the screen? That's her real reaction. Because that's the one thing she did not want to happen. So sometimes you you find those happy accidents, you know. Um, even and then the actor's upset with you, of course, for the rest of the day. But uh, it all works out well. Even just a, a quick thing on Kill Bill, when Mike Madsen gets bit by the black mamba, strikes him, Mike um, I have these snakes, mechanical snakes on, on rods. And so I'm rehearsing it with him, you know, striking, striking his face, and Mike's like, don't hit me in the eye. I'm like, okay, I'll do my best. He's like, do better than your best. We're shooting it, and I, you know, I'm striking, striking, and then boom, right into his eyeball. And he just goes, ape shit, as he should. And he's flying around, throwing stuff, and then Quentin cuts, and he's screaming and yelling, and Quentin just comes up and goes, dude, that was great, I'm so glad you hit me in the eye. <laughs> That couldn't have been any better. But everything was fine with Mike and I. I said, dude, I, and actually Mike said, I leaned into it. That's what happened. I leaned into it. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's right. You leaned into it. <laughs> so, do um, you have anything you want to say before we start the movie? Let these people watch a cool movie? No, I've just been enjoying the stories. Let's watch the film. Yes, so. Jane. We've got beautiful That was probably Tom. <laughs> yeah, it was probably Tom's idea. We just kind of enhanced it, so. You know, his character's name is Sex Machine, and we're like, yeah, okay, we can kind of do that. So, you know, you get away with crazy things. When you come up with all the gags, do you just um, sit around drinking beer, like, all night and just think of all the craziest things you can do? No, or do they come no, on a one-by-one one No, no, we're just, we're, we're actually working. You know, we're working no. and making, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding you not. Working and doing stuff, and it just kind of feeds your enthusiasm. You're like, hey, no, it'd be really cool, and it just keeps building and building and building on one thing after another after another. 
I just wanted to ask, was there any of, uh, any particular prosthetic or of the body suits that were just very challenging on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, you know, what was nice is not all the makeups played every day. That was great. Mm -hmm. You know, if we had, like, Tom played 60 days, that would be a bit much. But, you know, he's, he's a vampire for a very short period of time. Everybody's a, a vampire for a short period of time. What was hard about that show was the hours. We never left. We just slept in the makeup room. I think I went home once to see my wife and take a shower, get lay in my bed for an hour, got up and went back to the set. Um, but I was really young and I had the energy. Today I feel like no way in hell am I doing that. But uh, yeah, it was just a different time and, and uh, different attitude and, and you just did it, you know? And it was really, really fun, really fun. Any other questions, anybody? Yes, up there. Um, when I went to see this, so I went along, obviously, you know, the whole thing with Santino is going on right now, I went along to see it, I didn't expect the second half. Right. Were you guys all in on the, was it kept a secret? I, I, I don't recall. I, I, you know what, I, I think, well, I don't think it was kept a secret, but you also have to remember back then there wasn't the internet, there wasn't spoilers, there was, with, you know, the only time any reviews came out is when the movie came out and the reviewers saw the film, you know, or got a little preview. But there weren't any leaks back then. It wasn't anything like that. And we just kind of kept things quiet. And it wasn't that it was a surprise. We just probably didn't think about it. We, we knew what the movie was. We knew it was, you know, a nonlinear story. And, and uh, you know, it's going to start this way and then go this direction. But, yeah, it wasn't like, oh, we have to be quiet. It was, it was before, it was when we were able to get printed scripts that didn't have stuff all over and insecurity and nonsense and you know it explodes after five minutes of reading it so. i remember going to the press show of this and uh being told that it was a vampire movie oh yeah okay. and that was like all anyone knew and then you're sitting watching it and it's like um you wanted to tell the publicist no i think you've made a mistake it's a gangster film yeah. and it's like it's like no it's a gangster film it's like yeah you just just sat there forgot about it and then halfway through it's like oh yeah okay yeah there was so no, you definitely won't have that surprise, sorry. Wife and say, what the hell happened in the second half? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very, it's very, you know, it's from the mind of Bob Kurtzman, and then Quentin took it and made it even, you know, crazier and greater, so, you know. It's it like one of those moments, it's like the shower sequence in, in Psycho, it's something that comes up halfway through and just changes the nature of everything. It's like not many films have had the balls to do that. Right, yeah, no, it's very, very uh, unique film. Any other questions from anybody? Yes. Um, Howard, uh, I think uh, Quentin had uh, directed Pulp Fiction by the time this had come out. Um, I would say, yeah, yeah, I think you're correct. So was he kind of starting to have a go at directing this with Robert? No, no, not at all. He was great about that. So he would always say, Robert's the director. So Quentin wrote it, he was the producer, but he wasn't directing in any way. And, and uh, it was Robert who was directing the movie, absolutely. And Robert's a very singular voice as well, which I think is why Robert and Quentin get along so well. And, uh, you know, they, they both have a vision and they stick with it and you just go down that path, you know? So no, I never ever got any, any uh, direction from Quentin about anything, you know? We, actually, he had come in, got life cast, and then I didn't see him again until we got to set and we tested the makeup. So, you know, Robert would come to the shop and see the progress. But Quentin went off and did whatever he needed to do, and then when it came time to shoot it, he came and you know uh, acted in the film, and and uh, and that was it. So yeah, he gave Robert carte blanche and respected that, as he would expect somebody to do to him as well. So it was it was great. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, just to add to that, was um, if you know, was Quentin always meant to play? Ritchie, or was it kind of with someone else? Kind yeah, of I don't know what I don't know. No, I don't. I'm not sure actually. I mean, maybe Clinton wrote it for himself. I'm not sure when it was going to be another movie, uh, or when Bob Kurtzman wanted to do it. It obviously was going to be different actors. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't. I don't ever remember having the conversation. I just heard, oh, you know, Clinton's going to come into live casting, and uh, he's, you know, for the Richie thing. So, but yeah, I don't recall. Yes. Uh, would they, well, all day long. Like, so with, using Quentin as a point of reference. So we would put Quentin in makeup, let's say, at 6 a.m., and he would shoot all day, like could be 14, 15 hours. So yeah, very long days, really long days. So yeah, it, it, would, it would, and the guys that came in in vampires, until they were dead, they, were vamp they stayed in vampire makeups and so forth. 
Yes. Everything's foam rubber. This is way be so in case if some of you might not know, there's different materials we use nowadays for prosthetics. We use silicones, we use this thing called pro, uh, prose transfers, foam rubber, which is the traditional. This is only foam rubber back then. Silicone is really new. It has, it's only been used for maybe 10 years or so. So it's, it's relatively new. So everything is sil or foam rubber. Every makeup is foam rubber, So, which I love. I still use foam rubber all the time. Yes, back there, Ian. Uh, shot on film. Yes. What's the difference between shooting on film now now that you've moved on to digital? Yeah. Obviously, digital is clearer, sharper. Is it tougher? Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love film for sure because, well, especially for a movie like this, you know, when you're doing makeups, and it, and really the digital world doesn't it doesn't help any department other than post production and production, you know. And because they just roll the camera, I feel bad for the editors because they'll get like you know 400 hours of whatever's on set because the directors never cut. You know, it was always great when you have film because you have a time limit. The film runs out on the spool, and then you know, okay, I've got a five minute break. You know, I can go to the bathroom or go grab something to eat or whatever. Um, but now it's just like keep shooting, keep shooting, keep shooting. I also just don't like the way digital looks. You know, I think that there's something about film. You know, that looks beautiful and. Film and cinematic, you know. I, I you know, uh, digital is great for sports events and National Geographic's and wild animals, but not for telling film stories. So I'm a, I'm a film fanatic. I love it all. Luckily, there's still some filmmakers like Clinton and Christopher Nolan and J.J. Abrams and Steven Spielberg who shoot film. So when I take like one more question, if anybody has it, and we'll start. Uh, Yes, right there. Why do you think Quentin is? Um, right, I'll do two more. I'll say it <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you start that again? Sorry. Why do you think Quentin is slightly underappreciated in the U.S.? I, I don't think he. I, I appreciate he him. <laughs> I think he's amazing. Uh, maybe uh, I don't know if it's. A, I don't. No, I don't feel that way. Uh, maybe it's a matter of. He seems to be loved more in Europe. Maybe I, I. Yeah, I don't know. I, I love the guy. So and I love all his movies. You know. Um, yeah, maybe because he makes, he doesn't pump a film out, you know, he's not making product. Uh, he really makes art, you know, he makes the films he wants to see, which I really appreciate, because they're usually the films I want to see as well. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I don't know, you know. Uh, I appreciate the hell out of him, so. You had a question? Yeah, uh, what do you think makes a good monster? What makes a good monster? Okay. Um, well, it's a lot of different elements. So, you know, like, let, let's take the alien from the film Alien, all right, which is a super cool monster, super scary, but that's, it's a great design by H.R. Giger, who's a, a Swiss surrealist. And um, uh, what makes that work is the, the design, of course, but also how Ridley Scott utilized it. So, you know, in terms of, like, flashing lights, and it's wet, and there's just, it's moving slow, and the way he photographed it, and the steam, and all that stuff. That is what makes it scary. You can take that same creature and like put it in the middle of Disneyland, and you wouldn't be scared of it because it's like, hey, look, the aliens at Disneyland, you know? So so much of it is all the different elements. You can come up with something really cool, and I can come up with anything, and it could either be really cool with the way it's utilized, or it just ends up being crap, which is happens as well. You know, I've done films where we've done really cool creatures, and they shoot it completely wrong, light it wrong, shoot it all the wrong angles. And you're like, what in the hell, you know? Um, if you watch the Guillermo del Toro Hellboy movies, he always shoots low on Hellboy, on Ron Perlman, which makes him look really, really big. It's cool, because Ron's not a, a giant guy. Um, but it makes him look gigantic. And then this last Hellboy movie that came out, which Guillermo didn't do, they shot him all at eye level. And I'm like, that's the biggest mistake, because then he just looks average size. And then they have him with actors that are taller than him, and I'm like, Hellboy's so peewee is some of these actors. But it's like, it's, that's the trick, you know? Figure out, like, live in this world. And that's what, like, Guillermo del Toro does. It's like, this is, this is the world this stuff's gonna live in, you know? And Guillermo loves shooting up at things because it just gives them more of a presence. It's, it's really great filmmaking at those points. Well, I'll just shoot like this and shoot like this. And yeah, there's one scene in the new Hellboy movie, and he's like with three guys that are way bigger than him. And I'm like, he's like a runt. This is it's not Hellboy. Hellboy's a fucking gigantic. Put him on a box, for God's sakes. So, um, all right. So, 
let's wrap up our yapping our big mouths and let's watch Death Till Dawn. I hope you guys love it. We had a great time making this movie. It was, like I said, it was probably an eight week shoot. We started, the first thing they started with is the beginning of the movie, which is all the Bakersfield stuff at, at the liquor store. And, um, and then we went into six weeks of solid vampire fun. And, uh, and then we finished the movie and survived somehow. And, Turned out to be really cool, way cooler than we had. Well, no, we always thought it was going to be cool. Um, just remember, afterwards, we'll be in that private, in the members, uh, what's it called? Members bar. Members bar. We'll be there if you guys want to come talk, ask more questions, buy a book, we'll sign the book, whatever you want. Uh, but I really want to thank you guys for coming and yeah, hope you thanks. enjoy the movie. Let's hear it for Howard. He's amazing. <laughs>